On April 29th, it was reported that the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, was preparing to end a year-long regulatory crackdown on large technology companies, allowing them to play a greater role in boosting the economy. On the same day, Bloomberg published a report that Chinese and U.S. regulators are actively communicating on how to implement audit drafts on Chinese stocks for on-site inspections and other related matters to avoid delisting of Chinese companies and to lay the groundwork for resuming their listings in the U.S. as soon as possible. Once the news came out, shares of several Chinese internet giants soared, with Alibaba soaring 12%, Jingdong up more than 8%, and Tencent up 7%. CCP leader Xi Jinping recently asked the entire society to make an all-out effort to boost China's economy through infrastructure investment. Behind the seemingly good news is a growing fear in Beijing about China's economic growth. The reality is that the current economy in China may be far worse than what the general public can imagine. It is particularly noteworthy that some Chinese investment and financial experts who have always sung the praises of the Chinese economy and who are deeply familiar with the political and economic workings of the Communist Party are beginning to voice strong warnings. The Financial Times has obtained a video of an internal meeting of the Hong Kong-based group PAG. PAG is the largest private equity fund managed in Asia with 50 billion US dollars in assets. In the video, PAG's CEO said, we think the Chinese economy is in the worst shape it's been in the last 30 years. He stated that public discontent in China is at its highest point in the past 30 years and emphasized that his fund has diversified away from China and is extremely cautious about its portfolio in China. He mentioned that much of the Chinese economy, including its financial center, Shanghai, has been semi-paralyzed by the draconian COVID-0 policy and the impact on the economy will be profound. It is extremely rare for prominent executives doing business in China to criticize the CCP or its government. Shan Wei Jian was a co-managing partner of private equity group TPG Capital Asia and previously led the China team at JP Morgan Chase. Earlier this year, he was appointed as an independent director on the board of Alibaba. He has also served on the boards of state-owned Bank of China Hong Kong Limited, Chinese state-owned steel producer Bao Steel Group, and Lenovo, China's largest computer company. The Financial Times cites him as a defender of the Communist Party's Xinjiang and COVID-19 policies and as a supporter of China's territorial claims to Taiwan. The founder and CEO of New York-based capital research firm J.L. Warren Capital said in a Bloomberg TV interview about the Shanghai lockdown, the COVID situation really brings China into a very dark moment, perhaps the darkest in terms of the economy in the last few decades. In a sense, it's a crisis of confidence and you've got this concerted frustration and resentment in China's wealthiest city about a very irrational policy. Li Lan Miller, CEO of China Beige Book International, a research firm that focuses on China's economic data, said that if the CCP sticks to its COVID-0 policy and fails to control infections, any economic stimulus will be meaningless. He said, the Chinese economy is likely to face an absolute bloodbath in the second quarter. If 40% of China's population is on lockdown, or 40% of China's GDP is on lockdown, you can talk about stimulus policies all you want, but what are you going to stimulate? You can't energize the economy in the usual way, so they are in a very difficult position. The weeks-long lockdown has left Shanghai, China's largest city and financial capital, in limbo. In late April, a surge of cases in Beijing prompted Communist Party officials to impose a limited closure, leading to panic buying across the capital city. Miller said, If you're shutting down these metropolises, if you're shutting down four of China's largest ports for weeks or even months, then yes, you're going to have a supply chain disaster. On April 25th, a sell-off on the Chinese stock exchange caused the Shenzhen Stock Exchange to drop 6% and the Shanghai Stock Exchange to fall more than 5%. Meanwhile, the renminbi fell to its weakest level since November 2020, and the unemployment rate in 31 cities across the country rose to 6% in March, the highest level on record. The International Monetary Fund has cut China's growth forecast for this year to 4.4% from 4.8% in January. Global financial services companies Barclays and Goldman Sachs have also lowered their growth estimates for China to 4.5%. UBS's latest China growth forecast released on April 19th lowered its original 5% forecast to 4.2%.
Economists generally expect that the 5.5% growth target set by the communist government is almost impossible to achieve. William Rhodes, former senior vice chairman of Citigroup and former chairman of Citibank, said in a CNBC analysis that there are four distinct but overlapping and reinforcing threats to China's economic outlook. Real estate, the COVID-0 policy, Belt and Road debt risks, and the Russia-Ukraine war. First, China's real estate is in crisis. China's debt crisis in real estate continues. Starting with the Evergrande Group's debt crisis in 2021, a record number of Chinese real estate developers have defaulted on their debts. S&P estimates that 20 to 40 percent of real estate developers could face default on their debt. According to a January report by the Peterson Institute for International Economics, a nonpartisan think tank, real estate development accounts for 25 to 30 percent of China's economy and is an important engine of growth. Since last summer, most residential real estate developers in China have reported sharp declines in contract sales. According to a Wall Street Journal analysis of their monthly stock exchange filings, many developers have also disclosed a significant drop in average sale prices in 2022. Industry giant Country Garden Corp, one of China's financially stronger developers, reported a 14% drop in its average sales price in January and February, compared with the same period in 2021. Logan Group, a mid-sized developer, said its average selling price fell nearly 40% year-on-year in the first two months of 2022. Official data from the National Bureau of Statistics of China shows that China's housing market declined across the board in the first quarter of 2022, with average commodity house prices, sales volumes, sales revenue, and investment growth all falling sharply, making it the most depressed housing market in 20 years. The average price of commercial properties in China officially fell below the 10,000 RMB or US 1600 per square meter mark in the first quarter of 2022, down 10.3% year on year. The sales floor area of commercial properties fell 13.8%, including an 18.6% drop in residential sales. And sales revenue of commercial properties plunged 22.7%, including a 25.6% drop in residential sales. In addition, real estate development investment grew by only 0.7% in the first quarter, down 24.9% from the same period last year, which was at 25.6%. Capital in place for developers fell by 19.6% year-on-year, of which Chinese domestic loans fell by 23.5%, foreign investment by 7.8%, and personal mortgage loans by 18.8%. Economists have established in general that most recessions are either linked to stocks or to housing market meltdowns. The effects of debt on falling housing prices are well known. The former amplifies the latter and can lead to a broader consumption collapse. Second, China's COVID-0 policy has a devastating effect on its economy. China's economy is clouded by the troubled housing market and made worse by the impact of the CCP's COVID-0 policy. As the virus mutates and spreads rapidly, the harsh anti-epidemic measures are taking a heavy toll. As a major financial and trade center, Shanghai contributes 3.8% to China's GDP. The lockdown of Shanghai has led to the closure of many factories, and while some of the largest factories are keeping afloat by adopting closed-loop management, the lockdown has left truckers, warehouses, and other key links in the supply chain in limbo. According to a survey by Nomura Securities from Japan, at least 45 cities in China had implemented full or partial lockdowns as of April 13, affecting up to 26.4% of the population and accounting for 40.3% of China's GDP. However, India's Observer Research Foundation says more than 70 cities in China are already under full or partial lockdown. China's weakening demand will be felt in other parts of the world. Meanwhile, strict city closures or semi-city closures by the CCP are having a devastating impact on the industry chain. It's increasing the uncertainty of production disruptions and speeding up the diversification of production capacity away from China. For example, South Korea relies heavily on China in four major global industries. Batteries, semiconductors, important metal materials, and pharmaceuticals. Its Ministry of Industry, Trade and Resources said on April 29th that it plans to build a supply network with countries that own core minerals and resources through bilateral and multilateral trade cooperation channels to ensure the supply of raw materials.
It also plans to promote economic cooperation such as the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework IPEF, or Free Trade Agreement FTA, to reduce its dependence on China. Third, China's BRI loans are risky. Interest rates are rising in developed countries as they try to control inflation, and the Fed is expected to raise rates by a significant amount, 50 basis points each in May and June. Many of the loans provided by Chinese entities as part of the Communist Party's Belt and Road Initiative will not only strain the balance sheets of low-income countries around the world, but will also burden Chinese banks with non-performing loans. This in turn will affect the economic performance of these banks, which are a key conduit for helping China's domestic investment, businesses and economy. According to a 2021 report by Aid Data, an international development research lab based at the College of William and Mary in Virginia, the Belt and Road Initiative has already resulted in developing countries incurring a debt of at least 385 billion U.S. dollars. Sri Lanka, a country considered by the CCP to be a Belt and Road priority, is in a serious economic crisis. Whether Sri Lanka will repay its debt to China is under great scrutiny. China faces three negative implications in relation to the Belt and Road Initiative. Debt default, non-performing loans on the books of China's largest banks and state lenders, and collateral damage to diplomatic and geopolitical interests if China seizes national assets of partner countries as part of harsh loan terms. Fourth, Russia's invasion of Ukraine will affect China profoundly. Globalization, which powers China's economy, is likely to come to a halt under the pressure of the pandemic and the Russia-Ukraine war. Supply chains will either be disrupted or regrouped, further reducing the amount of foreign capital invested in China. The CCP's choice to support Russia rather than keep China deeply rooted in globalization is a short-sighted, destructive economic bargain. The U.S. has warned Beijing that supporting Russia could lead to secondary sanctions against Chinese companies by Western countries. China could also pay a heavy price if the Communist Party continues to support Russia at the expense of engagement with the West, on which China's economic growth depends. According to the Voice of America, China may not be as resilient to sanctions as Russia. Russia is the world's number one resource country and a major exporter of two key sectors, energy and food. It's because of foreign dependence on Russian energy that the EU has so far not reached a consensus on an embargo on Russian fossil fuels. Western sanctions haven't cut off the blood flow of energy exports to the Russian economy, and the financial sanctions seem to have left a big back door as well. China, on the other hand, is an importer of both of these vital sectors. It's the world's largest importer of oil and has been increasing its food imports over the years. The most obvious example of China's heavy reliance on imports from its so-called rival countries is the semiconductor chip, which is indispensable for almost all modern products. China is the world's largest consumer market for semiconductors, but it's heavily dependent on imports. China's semiconductors have even surpassed crude oil as the country's largest imported commodity item. All of these challenges suggest that the CCP's official forecast of 5.5% economic growth in 2022 will likely be just that, a forecast. In fact, it seems more likely that China's growth rate in 2022 will be less than 5%, much less than 5% the lowest economic growth rate since the crisis caused by the 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre.